get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. There's no better person to talk about how to overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Dr. Joe Vitale. He's also known as Mr. Fire. He's the founder of Hypnotic Marketing with clients like Red Cross, PBS, many more. He's the author of many best-selling books, over 50, including The Attractor Factor, Zero Limits, my personal favorite. And just in the title alone, Dr. Joe, you'll see see his hypnotic marketing style. And it's called The Power of Outrageous Marketing, Using the Time-Tested Secrets of Titans, Tycoons, and Billionaires to Get Rich in Your Own Business. He's been on Larry King Live, Donnie Deutsch, The Big Idea, CNN, soon to be HBO because he's a strong man, and he was on the hit movie The Secret. Joe, thanks for joining me. Of course. It's uh, it's an honor. I'm flattered to be here. Thanks for inviting me. (sighs) Yeah, and you know, I have to thank and give a shout out to David Garfinkel for the introduction. Um, How do you and David know each other? We've known each other for well over a decade, but back in the baby days of the internet and we were copywriters who were helping each other. David is a genius. David is a dear friend. He is, uh, we have a bromance going on here. I just love the guy. Love the guy. So we go way back. What's a fly in the wall of one of your intense marketing conversations or copywriting conversations look like with David? With David? Yeah. Oh, high energy, unexpected turns and all kind of directions. He may actually break into song and start singing a show to Both of you. <laughs> I may pick up a horseshoe and bend it. I mean, we <laughs> anything goes. We're just having a, a great time. And that's one of the wonderful things about us is that there is no limit to the thinking. And so we are allowed ourselves to go down rabbit hole. Anyway, bye. Yeah. And, you know, fun fact about you is, besides the cigar meditations, um, you also have 15 music albums. I, I do. And within the last four years, oh. it was on my bucket list to become a musician. And I decided to do it, learn how to play guitar, write songs, sing, play saxophone. I did play harmonica anyway. But in the last four years, I have 15 albums out with Mm. this one being the the most recent singer-songwriter, One More Day. Yeah. And I want to – go ahead. uh, This is how you market, you know. You just talk about your stuff and you go, and here it is, by the way. Yeah. And I think I read somewhere if you show a picture, you're more likely to sell it. Is that true? Uh, Absolutely. People like visuals. They like visuals. They want to be able to see things. It stops them. Yeah. And, you know, you've done so much. And when I research you – Joe, is two things stick out, execution and production. You are a master at getting things done. So I want to hear about a little bit of what's, what you're working on now. I know you have Attract Money now and then also The Secret Prayer. Just talk a, a second about both of those. Well, uh, Attract Money Now is a book that I wrote a while back, and I give it away to help people. It's at attractmoneynow.com. Mm-hmm. It has a seven-step formula in it that helped me leave homelessness because I was homeless, went through poverty, to live the lifestyle of the rich and famous and have the honor of being on a show like this. This is so, the pinnacle of your career this, right now. This is it right here. <laughs> I, I have succeeded finally. And uh, so Attract Money Now is free. And uh, The Secret Prayer is my most recent book. It's an Amazon bestseller right now. And that's coming from the spiritual side of me, but I'm blending it with the metaphysical and the psychological with the law of attraction stuff that some people know me for. And then, of course, I just signed a book contract with a, with a drop-dead true deadline on it. And I have to get this done by December 15th. But this is the Awakened Millionaire Manifesto. Wow. And I am on a mission, and I am creating a movement to create awakened millionaires across the planet. These are people who are at peace with money and they're making a profit from their passion. These are just some of the things. I mean, I have more music coming out. I released some more singles the other day. Um, Always blowing and going and doing something. I can tell. You know, that brings up about 
50 questions, but I'll ask one of them. Um, <laughs> the, you know, your process for going with an idea, because you probably have a million ideas. Obviously, you went for it with the secret pair. What was the reason? How do you vet the next thing you're actually going to spend your time on? Yeah, that's a great question. I am very much driven by my own personal passion. Mm -hmm. When I get excited uh, about something for any number of untold reasons, I'll decide that's the project to do next and that's the project to do now. Mm -hmm. What I've learned is to take action as quickly as possible. Yeah. I've learned not to second guess myself, not to doubt myself, not to question myself. I think that's the big problem most people have. Yeah that they get an idea but they immediately say not me not now don't have enough money don't have enough education don't have enough experience don't have just fill in the blank and it yeah. goes on forever I've learned not to do that yeah. in order for me to be productive and to get 50 books written and 15 albums written and to do all the things that I do mm -hmm. I know that when an idea strikes it's coming to me as a kind of a gift from the universe. I didn't ask for it, I didn't pay for it, there it is, it's just come to me. Yeah. And so it, uh, I'm looking at it like I've gotten marching orders and what I want to do is take action on it and here's the other secret that yeah. most people don't know about. When you act on an idea as quickly as the idea comes, you get the ride, the energy of the idea mm. to actually complete it. Yeah. And that's what I do more often than not because if I wait, if you write down an idea and say, that's a great idea, I'll get to it in three months or six months. Right. If you do get to it, most of us won't, but if we do get back around to it, we'll look at it and the energy that came with the idea won't be there. Yeah. It'll just be a good idea. It won't be an exhilarating idea. Yeah, yeah. And so I act on my ideas, but I'll talk myself out of them. So what's your process? So now you have the idea and you want to execute on this book. I mean, you can have the idea and then people don't even know how to execute. What do you do? What's your process for like, okay, I got to get out the secret pair. It's got to come. I mean, December 15th is coming up, you know. Right. Yeah. So, uh, the, Well, one of the things I do is, is make very little time for interviews like this. <laughs> I, I, made an ex I made an exception because of our relationship with David Garfinkel. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, after I did my workout this morning and bent a horseshoe this morning, I immediately got on the computer and started working on the book. Yeah. Worked on the book all the way up to a few minutes before this interview. When this interview is over, turn it down, shut it off, and I go back to the book. Because I am under a deadline, and that is my focus. And mm. I can only focus on maybe three things with any sort of consciousness at any one time. And it's usually better if I focus on one thing until I write it to completion. Yeah. And when I get it done, then I can move on to the next. Yeah. So my process is a whole lot about decision, intention, focus, and action. Make a decision, I'm going to do something, I have the intention that I'm lining up my body and mind to make sure I'm doing just, just that. Yeah. And then I start taking massive action, focus entirely on it, and persistence and endurance until it's done. Yeah. Yeah, and Joe, you know, people look at you and be like, how is that even possible to produce that much? So can you break down some of the, what are you consider some of your most important daily rituals that allow you to be so productive? Well, one of the most important daily rituals is to make time for inspiration. Mm -hmm. So you semi-jokingly mentioned about my cigar meditations, and that's a real thing for me. Yeah. I actually, I enjoy a good cigar, uh, preferably the ones off from a small island off of Miami. And I will, <laughs> I will go outside, I've got a deck out in the woods over there, and I will sit up in the trees, and as I'm smoking my cigar, I don't have my laptop, iPad, or any of that stuff, so I'm not distracted. And I'm allowing inspiration to come. I'm allowing mm. my mind to just roam around and I'm available for ideas. Yeah. That's a very important thing. The other thing is I write every day. I consider myself a writer. I may be doing a dozen different things or known for a half a dozen different things, right. but I'm primarily an author. Yeah. So every day I'm writing a blog post, I'm writing an article, I send out an email virtually every day, yeah. I'm working on the next book. So some of the processes are there along yeah. those yeah, yeah. So, you know, before we talk about anything else, I need to mention the power of outrageous marketing. And you use one of the strongest factors in marketing, copywriting, um, curiosity. And I love one curiosity. Of, what's that? I love curiosity. I use it a lot. Yeah. When did you discover it? That's. This, I want to talk about something out of that book that I'm still curious about. But well, um, and I want well, to tease people. Go ahead. The Power of Outrageous Marketing is an audio program. Yeah. So you are you thinking of the Barnum book? No, is, I, I listen to the audio. 
Oh, okay. So yep. the Power of Outrageous Book um, is an audio program. Yep. It was my first one with Nightingale Conan. Yeah. And I think we recorded it back in 98 or 99. Oh, really? It's still as fresh as ever. You know, yeah. you just listen to it. Yeah. And Nightingale.com still sells it. So I learned about the power of curiosity from all the co copywriters that were before me. Mm -hmm. Robert Collier, David Ogilvy, John Caples, mm -hmm. Bruce Barton, all of these guys taught me about mm -hmm. copywriting. And I, I ended up leaning on curiosity because I know in hypnosis, you know, I wrote a book called Hypnotic Writing. Yeah. I applied hypnosis and copywriting and blended them together and yeah. wrote hypnotic writing. Right. Well, I knew that curiosity was the one that always made people lean forward. Yeah. You know, why is curiosity so powerful? Yeah. That is a curiosity provoking question. Yeah. Everybody now wants to know. And it's because of the nature of how the brain works. The mind wants to close loops. And yeah. if I open one with an open-ended, curious question, yeah. you may not have cared at all about curiosity before the question was asked. Right. But once it was asked, now your brain isn't happy until you hear what the answer is. And I have your brain on hold until I tell you that the curiosity things that I use it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I want you to tease people a little bit and open a loop. Tease or teach? What's it? Tease. Tease people for a second um, and open a loop because you did this in the book and you talk about your feeling at P.T. Barnum's grave and how it changed your life. Ah. I don't want you to reveal it right now. Maybe you'll reveal it later. Maybe at the end. Maybe they'll just have to get your book. A customer is born every minute to, to, to hear it. But um, tell Tell people about that part uh, of the book and when you were at the grave, but don't reveal how it changed your life. I did a lot of research for my book on P.T. Barnum. Yeah. Uh, the book's called There's a Customer Born Every Minute. And one of the things I did is I went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, which mm -hmm. has the Barnum Museum. There's the library that has all of his books and his writings. It's also where he uh, lived. He was mayor there and he's buried there. So I went there to do my research on my Barnum book. And one of the things I wanted to do was find his grave site. I wanted to see what monument was there. I wanted to see if I felt anything was there. I wanted to see if uh, esoterically he gave me a message while I was there. Mm. And I couldn't find his grave site. We drove all around the place. And something in me told me to go in a particular direction. It was just an intuitive hit. Right. And so I went in a particular direction and I saw this big monument. I thought, oh, that must surely be Barnum. And I got out of the car, walked over to it. It wasn't Barnum. It was some nobody. I didn't know who it was at all. And I turned around, and there was Tom Thumb's gravesite. And there's a three-foot statue, lifelike statue of Tom Thumb that was made while he was alive. Yeah. That is his tombstone. And then I turned around again, and there was a little marker, just a little concrete marker. And it said, P.T. Barnum, not my will, but thine be done. Hmm. And that's where I had a defining moment yeah. and a breakthrough in my relationship with Barnum. And I do write about it in the book. There's yeah. a customer born every minute. And it is in the audio program that you have, The Power of Outrageous Marketing. Yes. But, but when you do mention in the audio, when you first mention it, you're like, I'm not going to tell you now. It may be <laughs> later or it may, you may have to buy my book, A Customer Born Every Minute. So. Yeah. So maybe we'll talk about it at the end. Maybe not. But um, I wanted we'll to open see. that loop. Yeah. Um, so, Joe, how'd you get the nickname Mr. Fire? A girlfriend I had decades ago started calling me Mr. Fire. And I said, why are you calling me Mr. Fire? And she said, because you light a fire under everybody you meet. Hmm. Every time I saw her, I would just start talking about ideas and what she could do and what I can do. Yeah. And she just felt inspired. And so she came up with the nickname Mr. Fire. And back then, the internet was just starting and I named my website MrFire.com, yeah. M-R-F-I-R-E.com. Yeah. Love it. Didn't know any better. I mean, it just sounded like a good idea. And most people misspell my last name, Vitali, but they don't misspell Mr. Fire. So it became a moniker. Yeah, yeah. So what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were young? Uh, several things. I wanted to be, uh, the, I wanted to be Harry Houdini. Really? Um, I had the stage name of Harry Excello. Oh. I, even today, I'm a lifetime member of the Society of American Magicians. Really? I spoke, I spoke at a recent magic convention. I invented magic tricks when I was a kid. Wow. I used to allow my brothers to tie me up and leave me alone so I could uh, <laughs> <so I, laughs> 
<laughs> so I practice because I plan to be I'm sure they love that. Yeah, I plan to be thrown off a bridge all tied up, and I needed to practice beforehand. Wow. So, yeah, I wanted to be a magician. I wanted to be a baseball player. I thought I was going to be a detective. I thought I was going to be an actor at one point. And obviously, books were always in my life. I've always been a book nerd. Yeah. And somewhere in the early years, I decided that if I was an author, I can write about characters who were magicians or detectives or yeah. actors. So writing became it. Mm. I love magic too. So what's your favorite trick either that you invented or that you've seen? Oh, goodness. My favorite trick. Yeah. You know, I I know Lance. And when he was performing in Las Vegas, he would make an entire car. And I always, I'm a car guy too. I have a car collection. I love cars. And so when Lance Burton would have somebody come out of the audience and he would put him in a car and he would make the car disappear, it was a very cool, freaky, wonderful moment for me and everybody there. Yeah. He's, he is amazing. Yeah. I've seen, like, watch his YouTube videos. Unbelievable. Um, books. And like, I got this from the research. You devour books. And, and I, I get that sense of from the power of outrageous marketing people should pay very close attention. Even in a chapter, you can tell that came out of studying like one chapter, 15 books on copywriters, you know, right. and you pull everything in and, you know, the stories combined with the actual tactics uh, are really powerful. Um, what books, what are on your favorite of all time books? Oh, well, there, there's a lot of them. Uh, I am a book freak. I mean, I am surrounded now with books all around me and I have another library away with books and then I've given away books. Um, but I do have books that are just amazing to me. Yeah. Um, the Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol yeah. was a book I read when I was a kid. Yeah. It came out in the 50s. It's still in print today. And it was one of the first books that taught me that if I can truly believe something with, uh, with integrity and congruence in me, it would come to pass. Mm -hmm. And that was a very powerful book. Uh, the Book of Est by Luke Reinhardt. Est was the Earhart seminar training of the 1970s, and Werner Earhart is still alive and well. He's 80 years old, and he's going back to teach again. Yeah. But that book taught me about personal responsibility, taught me about beliefs, taught me about action. It's a, it's a very hypnotic read, and I read it decades ago, and as it turned out in life, I met the author, and I republished the book. Wow. So the book, the book of Est, is back in print. It's on Amazon, and I'm the one who published it. Yeah. So uh, the Robert Collier letter book changed my life yeah changed my life i was an okay copywriter before that book i was a hypnotic mm. copywriter after that book yeah the robert collier letter book i still remember the moment i found it i was in a used bookstore and i knew robert collier from his metaphysical books i didn't know that he was a copywriter and had no idea i read all of his secret of the ages kind of stuff when i was growing up from mm. the public library and I was in Houston, and there was a used bookstore, and there was this great big hardcover. And it said the Robert Collier letter book, and it had the yellow dust jacket on it. And I went up to the salesperson, and I said, is this the same Robert Collier that wrote all the metaphysical books? And she said, I don't really know. And as I flipped through the books, I saw all the references to the other books. And I immediately bought it, and oh, what an awakening for me. That, that book, hands down, for me as a copywriter, that was a turning point for me. Yeah, yeah. And even in the, the book, The Outrageous Marketing, you talk about how you bought some really old magazines that yes. you found that yes. he edited uh, too. Yeah, he edited Mind, Inc. Yeah. He had a monthly magazine called Mind, Inc. And it is brilliant. I've collected every one that I could find, and I still look for more. I don't know how many years it was in production. But he wrote it. He edited it. So it's full of original articles. And he was a captivating writer. Yeah. And again, he's one of my sources for when I wrote Hypnotic Writing. I was yeah. inspired by Robert Collier. Yeah. And obviously, Joe, you're you know, influenced by a lot of books that you read. And I'm wondering, what was a big influence growing up for you? Well, the biography of Harry Houdini. Hmm. Uh, I think it was the way the Walter Gibson one. I actually have my original copy downstairs, the one I read as a kid yeah. <laughs> 55 years ago. And it taught me outrageousness. It taught me publicity, marketing. Um, it taught me about um, the power of getting the world's attention. Because Houdini, of course, has been dead for a very long time. Yeah. But everybody knows who he is. Yeah. And he's actually, as you Good point. 
probably he's not known as the world's great magician, and most of the promotion came from himself. So we know him today because of all the promotion, which is the same reason for Barnum. Mm. So those that early book really taught me more than I even knew I was being taught when I first read it. I just thought it was a fascinating story, and it made me want to be like Houdini. Yeah. What um, was a big influence for your dad? I was watching a video, this really touching video, um, of you and your dad. And what are some <laughs> big lessons you learned from him? Well, the, the biggest lesson I learned about from him was hard work. Yeah. He put me on the railroad tracks when I was five years old. What were you doing? I was supposedly working. I don't know if I actually was or not because I was five. I don't remember it. But he wanted me to learn how to work. And he yeah. knew that if you went out there and labored, he would pay me. We never got an allowance. But he would pay me, and I think I got a dollar an hour or something like that. It could have been a dollar a day. I don't remember. And uh, he worked on the railroad his entire life and retired from it. And he did all the labor. He was a supervisor out there. So he yeah. was in control of who went on the tracks. He got side jobs and so forth. But as a kid, he got me up early. I went with my father, and I went to work. And I learned early on what it was like to do manual labor. And I learned early on I did not like it. <laughs> That's a big lesson. Yeah. It probably drove me into, I want to go in the world of books. <laughs> get, get me off the railroad tracks. Yeah. But I learned to get up early. I still get up early today. He used to get up. He still gets up four in the morning himself. I wow. don't, I'll get up five or six in the morning. Wow. But I can get a whole lot of things done before the rest of the world brews their coffee. Yeah. And that was one of the things I learned from my father. Yeah. So just talk a second about what you did for him on his birthday. Oh, well, about six years ago, my father said, he, uh, he asked me, he said, if I recorded his life story, if he recorded his life story on cassettes yeah. and sent them to me, could I turn it into a book? And I said, sure, I can do that. And I forgot about it. Six years went by. And last January, I got a box in the mail from him with a cassette player, a letter, and about 15 90-minute cassettes. <laughs> And I thought, oh shit, he did it. <laughs> and then, oh, oh shit, who listens to cassettes? So I had to hire a transcriptionist, hire an editor. We formed that, all of those tapes, into a book. And I used the Amazon's Create Space publishing program. And I printed a, the book. I put it on Amazon and I printed a couple copies of it. Yeah. And then I went to Ohio, which is where he's at. And for his 90th birthday, yeah. We filmed this, and this is the video you probably saw because it's on YouTube. Yep. I asked my father, I said, today you're 90 years old. Is there anything left not done? And he immediately said yes. He said, first, he has three cans of coffee. <laughs> <and he's dead. laughs> three cans of coffee in the cupboard. You know, depression era mentality. You have to use everything. Up. Right, right. Uh, so we wanted to do that. Second of all, he said he hadn't won the lottery yet. And he was still playing every week. He wanted to win the lottery. And it wasn't for him. He wants it for his family. He wants to give the money to all the kids and grandkids. Yeah. And then third is he wanted to see his book finished. And he wanted me to buy him a Reuben sandwich in exchange for the book. And he didn't know that I had finished the book. He didn't know that I had the book in my hand. Mm -hmm. I had a paper bag. And I it said, looks well, like I uh, like someone with a, like a wine bottle drinking in the yeah. It was, like, it was like a wino, you know. I had this folded over paper bag. It wasn't wrapped at all. And I said, Dad, you know those cassettes you sent me? And he said, Yeah. And I said, I did what you asked me to do. And I said, Here is your book. Wow. And my father, for maybe the first time in his life, he was speechless. He was red faced. Yeah. He was choked up. And you can see it in the video. For sure. And I, his son, finally was able to give him something. Because throughout my life, he's, re he's resisted, refused, and even been insulting in trying to give him gifts. And he just throws them back. He doesn't want anything. Mm. And again, in that I gave him the book. Joe, hold on. Uh, it looks like it's sorry. It's uh, it looks like it's um, fading a little bit. Like the uh, the connection's fading a little bit. I'm gonna give it a, a chance to okay. catch up. 
It's like, uh, sorry, it cut uh, out where you said you gave him the book. Oh. Uh, um, but basically, you were saying how he's never taken a gift from you before. And no. this one, he finally did take, and people should check it out. Um, what was the title? The book is called uh, The Most Contented Man. Yeah. The Most Contented Man. Yeah. And people read it, and they give me great feedback. They give him feedback. I actually created a monster because he has an idea for another book. <laughs> You're going to get a box full of cassette tapes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, Dan, what do you want to do now? And he says, I want to write a book on what I would do if I was president of the United States. Oh, and I said, do that one and do it now. Yeah. If Donald Trump's running, my father can run. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, you know, and people see you, Joe, with, you know, over 50 books on The Secret. Like, well, it's easy for him now, right? Because he's been on all these hit shows and movies. and But it wasn't always like that. Can you take me back to before? Yeah. Well, it was not a party. Yeah. I, uh, as I alluded to, I had been, I was homeless in Dallas, Texas in the late 1970s. Right. And there's no way to describe how tragic that kind of an experience is because you don't have any sense of hope. You don't have any self-esteem. You are living in a state of panic. You're living in a state of desperation. And it's very much focused on surviving, just surviving. I still wanted to be an author and was still working to do that, but I was struggling beyond comprehension. Yeah. I managed to get out of it, moved to, the homeless time was in Dallas, I managed to get to Houston, but I was in poverty there for almost 10 years. Oh. And you're talking about such struggle that I got married during that time and both of us were really kind of alone people, we're struggling together and alone through our own process. And I remember she dropped the jar of tomato sauce one night when she was going to make spaghetti, cheap comfort food, right? And uh, it broke on the floor. And I didn't have the $2.50 to buy another jar. Wow. And it was those kind of memories that haunted me. And I just kept thinking, when is this ever got to shift? When is it got to you know, move in the right direction for me? And it did, but it did it very slowly. I had a play produced in 1979 in Houston. That was a big deal, but it didn't pay me a dime. I started getting articles published, and occasionally they would pay $25 or $50, which was like winning the lottery when it happened. I did have a book published in 1984, and it was a celebration because I was finally published, yeah. but I didn't make a dime from it. All I, that was where I had to learn marketing, mm. because in 1984, when the book was published, I realized... Publishers know how to publish books. They don't know how to promote books. Right. And I had to learn marketing for my first client, which was me. Yeah. And so slowly, over time, I mean, I'm an overnight success. If overnight means 30 years. Right, exactly. You no, know, it's certainly not overnight. Yeah. So th there was a long, long line of struggle. What was your first book in 1984? Zen and the Art of Writing. So you were even into Zen back then? Oh, yeah. I was into metaphysics as a kid, and so I was reading the Robert Collier metaphysical books at that point, but mm -hmm. I was reading philosophy. And when I was at homeless in Dallas, I lived in the public library, mm -hmm. and I went through my own educational system because I just went to the floor that had all the self-help books, metaphysical books, philosophy, religion, um, pop psychology. That's the area where I hid. Mm. That's where I lived, and I read all of those books, literally devoured all of those books, The Magic of Believing, Thinking Grow, it's all the six of that. Yeah. So, yeah, I was very much into it. Yeah. So how do you think you ended up there? Because if I look at you, you're an avid reader, you got instilled hard work, you know, all these positive attributes, how do you think, what was holding you back during that time that, that caused you to be in that situation? That's the wonderful question. It's an absolutely great question, and I, I know the answer. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time. And what I was doing was essentially modeling the lives of self-destructive authors that I admired. Hmm. Jack London changed my life as a writer. 
I love Jack London. I have signed Jack London books here at this point. And I read Martin Eden, Call of the Wild, and he's, he wrote 50-some books. Right. Most people know him just for two or three books, White Fang and a few other ones, The Sea Wolf. But he wrote a lot of books. His life was very dramatic, very adventurous. He was a pirate. He had been homeless. He struggled beyond belief. He was a socialist. Uh, he actually lived in the slums of London in order to write a book about what it was like. It was called The People of the Abyss, and it just fried me. Yeah. And a part of me, we do so many things unconsciously in our lives, a part of me unconsciously thought that my life had to be as dramatic as Jack London's mm. in order for me to be as success like he was. And it was reading all the books like The Magic of Believing that woke me up to the idea that my own beliefs mm. were creating the drama in my life. Yeah. And it's a good thing I woke up because Jack London was dead by 40. He, he didn't last very long. He made an impact, but by 40 years old, he's gone. And yeah. from all takes, it looks like a suicide. So I realized that I had to model better authors. Yeah, yeah. That was the big thing. Yeah. So after that first book published, when did you see things turning around for you? Uh, so the first book was 1984. So probably another 10 years. Yeah. And another 10 years after that. And I'm, I'm working all that time. I mean, I am writing. I am, I am doing my best to uh, learn about marketing, learn about copywriting. Right. Uh, people like Bob Bly and his books on copywriting deeply influenced me. Yeah. Uh, another one of those wonderful things about life is later we became friends. Later when he wanted advice about the Internet, he came to me. And now you know we support each other at this point. But right. back then, he was a published author teaching yeah. people how to make money from copywriting. Yeah. I didn't even know what copywriting was. I didn't yeah. know what the word meant. Right. But I wanted to make money from writing, and I thought, well, maybe this is one way to do it. Yeah. And obviously it was. Yeah. So it was a lot of little steps in, until, you know, in the mid-1990s, 95, 96, I started to get published. I wrote one of the first books on Internet marketing. It was called Cyber Writing, mm -hmm. and it came out when the Internet was really just becoming big. Everybody was talking about it. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew what to do on it. Right. Uh, there was a lot of controversy and a lot of uh, ghost-like considerations. So we didn't know what it was. I wrote cyber writing. I wrote the AMA Complete Guide to Small Business Advertising hmm. for the American uh, Management Association. Right. These books were very small paying items for me at the time, but credibility builders beyond belief. Yeah. Because then everybody wanted to deal with the person who wrote the book. Right. You can write, there's all kind of copywriters you can hire, but if you can hire the copywriter who wrote the AMA Complete Guide to Small Business Advertising, right. that's what you want. Right. So the books were leveraged by me to get better deals, to get better clients, to get more income. And then, of course, I just kept doing it, writing more and more books. I wrote a little book called Spiritual Marketing. Mm -hmm which was the one that was a blend of spirituality and metaphysics, and I released it reluctantly. But the book ended up being a bestseller. It was one of the first books that I was written about in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. It was a print-on-demand book. Picked up by a major publisher, renamed The Attractor Factor. A yeah. woman in Australia sees it. She turns it to me and asks if I'd like to be in a movie she's making about it. And that movie is The Secret. Right. So a whole lot of things started to tumble and ended up making a what I call a benestrophe. It's the, the opposite of catastrophe. A benestrophe is when a whole lot of wonderful things happen together. That's what you want in life, and that's what started to happen for me. Yeah, it, I love that. So, you know, it was interesting. So I was doing the research too, Joe. I found that you were talking in one uh, particular video about that you were afraid to release the spiritual marketing. Yes. Um, early on. Talk about that for a second and how you, you pushed, pushed through that because I feel like a lot of people are afraid to do things. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm going to say this. I, I discovered that your wealth is hiding under the very thing you're afraid to do. Yeah. Your wealth is hiding under the very thing you're afraid to do. And I learned this because I had written spiritual marketing on a whim, mostly from my sister. I have a younger sister I'm very close to, and she was struggling. She was on welfare, and I thought, she needs to know some of the things I've learned. Yeah. So I wrote Spiritual Marketing. And uh, it helped her. She got off welfare, raised her three kids. And every now and then, I would give the book out to friends or wherever I felt that was appropriate. But yeah. I was afraid to release it publicly. Yeah. 
Why? I was, because I was already published by Nightingale Conant, The Power of Outrageous Marketing, uh, the American Marketing Association, the American Management Association with cyber writing and some other books. Yeah. And I was afraid that if I came out with the metaphysical, spiritual side of me, that these very conservative companies would drop me. Mm. And so I was playing it safe. But secretly inside of myself, the metaphysics and the spirituality was really more me than the marketing was. Yeah. And so spiritual marketing was my blend of both and kind of my coming out, but I didn't do it publicly until I was at a seminar, a Science of Getting Rich seminar with Bob Proctor. It was mm. in Denver. And Bob had, had invited me to come as a guest. And to thank him, I gave him a copy of Spiritual Marketing, which just was a Xerox folded over staple booklet. And yeah. he looked at it and he said he loved the title. And then he read it, and he said he loved the book. Yeah. And then he stood up in front of everybody in the audience, and he says, hey, we have a guru here, a respected authority on marketing, and he, and he was talking about me. And he said, he has a new book. It's called Spiritual Marketing, and he held it up. And I panicked going, I don't have a new book. This is not available. <laughs> it's not published. And he said, you're all going to want it. Well, <laughs> after that talk, 250 people just stampeded me. Wow. And there was a publisher there who said, I'll publish your book. And I said, Smart well, publisher. <laughs> I said, you haven't even read it. He said, I don't need to read it. Look, look at the, the people that want it right now. Right. And, of course, I did publish it. It ended up being a big success. It ended up turning into the attractor factor. We changed the title. And it is my most beloved book. It is. Out of 50 I've written, yeah. it's the number one bestseller, it's the most translated, it's the one people read and talk about the most, yeah. and it's the one that got me into the movie The Secret. Yeah. So all because of a little booklet I almost didn't release yeah. because of fear. I love that story. Um, what was life like before and then after The Secret for you? Well, before it I was already doing pretty well because of the... Uh, the internet fame I was getting as a copywriter and as a marketer. Yeah. I had come out with those books that were one of the first on internet marketing. I was the first to go online. The internet has largely been driven and still really is by text. People still write, even though we have video and all this other stuff. Text is still what's driving it. And here I am as a hypnotic writer going mm. online. I was able to write material that was more captivating and compelling than most of the other people. Yeah. So it elevated my success. I also used the internet to make a lot of my books bestsellers, like The Attractor Factor. Yeah. Came out when the latest Harry Potter book came out, and Pope John at the time had come out with a book. And I used the internet and publicity in my copyright. Uh, I made a seller yet. So all of this made me pretty famous. But when The Secret came out, life changed forever. <laughs> because The Secret sent me all over the world. I think they know me on Pluto now and other planets out in space because The Secret is so well known and is so popular and is still traveling around the world today. So The Secret has made me notorious and famous as a spiritual teacher, where before it, I had fame as a internet marketer and copywriter. Yeah, yeah. So what opportunities came after The Secret for you that were impactful? Well, lots of them. Uh, bigger book deals, for one thing. I still remember a publisher calling me late at night, begging me to take his offer for really? the next book. And here I am as the guy who struggled for 30 years to get a book deal, and now publishers are calling me at night, right. begging me to take their offer because they know I've become a hot com commodity at that time, yeah. and the next books are going to sell. And it was kind of an awkward, ironic moment. And the same thing with Nightingale Conant. They showed up after not talking to me for 10 years. They had already been selling my first program and doing well at it and loving yeah. it, but didn't ask me to do anything else. After The Secret, oh, they wanted program after program, including one called The Missing Secret. And The Missing Secret has outsold all other Nightingale Conant programs. Really? Even Earl Nightingale. I still have a card from the president of Nightingale Conant saying, you are now our number one best-selling author, and you've outsold even Earl Nightingale. Yeah. So all of those kind of deals, speaking engagements, I was invited, I went to Russia, I went to Peru, I went to Poland, I went to Bermuda, uh, I went all over the world, I went to Kuwait just a few months ago, I've gone all over the world and all of these because people have either read my books or seen me in the secret or both and they just 
pay the money, pay the flight, and bring me on over. Yeah. And it's still happening. I'm in 12 other movies since The Secret. Yeah. Uh, another one was released last week and three more are coming out in 2016. Yeah. And as you mentioned, I was invited to be in an HBO special having a cameo acting role as a strong man. And where do they hear of me? The Secret, The Zero Limits, The Attractor Factor, all this, you know, yeah. it's yeah. an estrophy. So, Joe, what should people be using in their copy that you recommend? I know that in the book you talk about ADA, but then you also go for, take it further with the acronym TARGET. Yeah. Are there a couple of those that you could, in TARGET, that would be important to, uh, to mention to people? Well, I don't remember my own TARGET formula right now. I'd have yeah. to look it up in my book. But when you, you ask... You know your copywriting, yeah. Yeah, well, I know it uh, unconsciously. I can't go without reading my own book and bring yeah. it back up. That's the problem with writing 50 books. You don't remember everything that's in all of your books. You have to ask somebody like you who's more recently read it. Um, here's what I think needs to be in copy. I think copy needs to have curiosity in it. We talked about curiosity there. But if there isn't a reason for people to open up your sales letter, your email, um, whatever it is that you're trying to get them to read... That headline has to be the most riveting, the most compelling, the most curiosity-provoking possible. Yeah. One of the ways that I do that is I like to write open-ended questions that they cannot answer right. without opening up the, the, uh, the copy. Uh, it can't be a yes or no kind of a question. It has to be open-ended where they can't possibly even answer it unless they read the copy below it. And then I want my copy to be either I or you oriented. Too many people have passive writing, we writing. Some of this is obvious to people that have watched your interviews before, but I see it all the time. Yeah. I like to talk about you and what you will get. Right. You will get this, but I also want to focus on the benefits so that this will happen. Right. You will get this book. You will get Attract Money Now, which will reveal the seven secrets to attracting money so you can get out of debt, pay your bills, go for your dreams, attract more money, and live the life that you've been dreaming about. Right. So it needs to be that complete thing there. I'm also a big believer in having testimonials. Uh, the more testimonials, the better. Pondering is what the uh, evidence that what I'm talking about is going to work, and not for me, but from other people. Right. Write down... I have often sent out sell but testimonials. I always want to call to action that's in there. Almost not everybody, but a lot of people send out things. I still remember getting packages and letters from people. Eight pages long, 12 pages long, powerful, persuasive. No phone number, no email address, no order form, no way to order their product. Completely forgotten. That's crazy. Talk yeah. about sabotage. Talk about blowing it. So a call to action needs to be there. And another thing I do all the time, and I do it in my emails, I do it on my blogs, I add a PS. Yeah. The PS, the postscript, is an old school, traditional direct mail copywriting technique. But I still use it on the internet where very few people still use it. Because I know if I've got them engaged, I have another chance to, to sell them on something yeah. or to hit them again with a reminder of something. Yeah. So those are off the top of my head. Yeah. And that incorporates everything that you do talk about in the book and, and then some. What prompted you to write There's a Customer Born Every Minute? Oh, Barnum himself. Barnum himself. I had read an essay. Uh, let's see. Og Mandino had put together a book. It was something yeah. like The Greatest school. Salesman in the World or something? Or yeah, no? but he had a book that was called oh. Success Literature, or the, the University of Success is what it was called. And it was filled with essays and excerpts from other people. Hmm. And there was an article in there that was an excerpt from P.T. Barnum's autobiography. I read the excerpt and I said, my God, who is this guy? I know Barnum's name is the circus guy, but I didn't know anything more. Right. So I read that from Og Mandino, and then I went and got P.T. Barnum's autobiography. I read the autobiography, and I was riveted. I was riveted. The man was talking to me. He's telling me his life story. He's born dirt poor. He's got nothing going for him. He's going dur during the time of the Civil War. Yet, he's an entrepreneur. He thinks of all these wild things. He seems to have a marketing mind that nobody else has. Yeah. He takes amazing risk. He uh, runs for office. He's a politician, an entrepreneur, a showman. Uh, it just went on and on. And I delighted in his stories. Yeah. And I said, why hasn't somebody written about the business secrets of P.T. Barnum? Right. 
and I went to one of the publishers I had at the time, and they said they loved the idea. And then uh, me and another copywriter, in fact, it was uh, David Deutsch. Sure. David Deutsch and I came up with the title, There's a Customer Born Every Minute. Ah, okay. And, uh, yeah, and I did the, the research on it and wrote the book, but it was all because of Barnum himself. What a fascinating man. Yeah, so what's a big lesson from your research uh, on Barnum that people should take home? Well, what he did was see things differently than anybody else. And anybody can learn to do this because I've now learned to do this myself. He saw opportunities where other people just saw the commonplace or they saw a problem. They didn't see solutions and they certainly didn't see opportunities. Mm -hmm. And my favorite story is when he met uh, Charlie Stratton. Charlie Stratton was a little boy who was said to never grow beyond three feet tall. And all of Connecticut saw what a, what a sad story, what a curious story, and they left it at that. P.T. Barnum looks at him and goes, superstar. Hmm. I can turn that little boy into a superstar. Right. And he renames him General Tom Thumb. He works out a deal with the parents, and he teaches General Tom Thumb how to act, how to sing, how to be theatrical. And General Tom Thumb becomes America's first superstar, first celebrity, right. traveling the world and making millions of dollars. General Tom Thumb became a millionaire yeah. and had a life he never would have had anywhere close if it wasn't for Barnum and Barnum's ability to see an opportunity where everybody else just saw a problem. Yeah, That's yeah. what I admired most. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. You know, I, I was listening to you doing research, how you did research for him. And the same went for me doing research for you. There's so much. How do I categorize it? You had this process that you used where anything you found that fit in a certain, well, I'll let you tell it. It fit in a certain uh, folder. You actually put it folder, in right? a folder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was overwhelmed. Bart lived 80 years. And he did so many different things and was so good at them, I was overwhelmed. So I got 12 manila folders. And as I did my research, I would tuck into each folder whatever was relevant to that folder. Right. So in other words, he was an author. He wrote a lot of books, including his autobiography. Sounds anything like someone we know. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, anything related to writing went into the writing folder. Yeah. He was a speaker. He had lost all of his money because of a bad investment and he went bankrupt. He started to regain his money by going on the speaking circuit. Mm. And so whenever I came across references to his speaking, I had a folder called speaking. Went yeah. in there. Yeah. When it came to, he was a politician. He was mayor of Bridgeport twice. Did my research. So you can see what I was doing. I just divided it up. Right, and right. then when I went to go write the book, I would just pull one folder over and go, okay, yeah. this is the folder on writing. Let me talk about Barnum as a writer. Yeah, yeah, that's the only folder I would look at. Yeah, so I broke it down so it was manageable. Right. Yeah. So that really helped me actually with you. Um, <laughs> but so obviously I asked David Garfinkel. I'm like, what questions I do I need to ask Joe? Wow. So he actually we spent more than an hour on the phone actually talking oh, wow. about what we need to talk about and some of the things I've already asked. But one in particular, which I would have never thought about, was. He says you have a promotional process called Barnumizing. Yeah. And can you describe it and, and give an example? Wow. Yeah, I love Barnumizing. It's, it's a coin word inspired by P.T. Barnum. Yeah. Uh, P.T. Barnum did not think small. This man was going after the planet. He really did think. He didn't say there's a customer born every minute, but he thought there's a customer born every minute. Yeah. And so he did giant advertising, persistent publicity. He hired uh, reporters. He hired newspaper people. He took out ads. He traveled the world. He took his show by rail when it was early to do so around yeah. the planet. And I kept thinking, this man just keeps elevating everything he does. Right. He grabs every tool, every technology that comes around. He was the first to have a telephone. He was the first to have a burglar alarm. Whatever the, 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 the latest thing was, he grabbed it and tried to use it and use it in his publicity. Mm -hmm. He had a frickin' elephant plowing the front yard of his house. I mean, why? And it's because the railroad drove by his house, and when people looked out the window, they'd see an elephant, and they'd go, oh, that's Barnum's house. Then when I get into New York City, they go to the Barnum Museum. <laughs> so he Barnumized everything. Right. And so what I learned to do was to Barnumize everything in my life, my career, and to do it with other people. Instead of just thinking of coming out with a book 
how can well let's look at the book I'm writing right now, yeah. The Awakened Millionaire Manifesto. Yeah. If I think of it as just a book, okay, I want to write a book and I want it to be good, I want it to be published, and I want people to buy it. Yeah. If I barnumize it, I'll go, I want to create a movement around this book. Yeah. I want to be on a mission around this book. I want to get people that's a kind of an army that all become awakened millionaires who are soldiers promoting this that they're out there in every way, shape or, that we can think of, or the ones we haven't even thought of yet, that are actually promoting it. And then I start thinking to myself, what else would Barnum do? He'd probably be the first to put a billboard on the moon, big enough that when the moon is bright, they look up there and go, I can barely make it out, but it says, Joe Vitale, Awakened Millionaire. You That's know? a great idea, Joe. How are you going to do this? This is how. Yeah. This is, thank you, but this is how we work it. Yeah. Yeah. At first, it seems like a joke. You're just making things up. It's called up. Elon Musk right now. He it, probably uh, it well, he, he probably is working on it. But you start having fun with it. You start thinking out of the box. You're yeah. just joking around. But before you know it, it becomes a reality. Yeah. And it's no longer a book. It becomes something bigger than the book. Yeah. I did the same thing. When I spoke on P.T. Barnum, I thought, well, how do I uh, – well, let me give you a better example. How do I Barnumize the book when the Barnum book came out? And I thought, well, Barnum would do some sort of hunt. He'd have some sort of humbug going on. And so in Austin, Texas, six years ago, I held the world's first canine concert. And a canine concert is a rock and roll show done for dogs only. At a sound level, only dogs can hear. <laughs> and how I got publicity is, first of all, I sent out a news release as a survey asking people, uh, I'm planning to do a dog concert. What is the favorite music that your dog likes to listen? <laughs> and people wrote back, you know, classical, this, that, and the other. But rock and roll was the one everybody, every dog wanted to listen to, supposedly. Okay. And then I got a band to donate their time. They thought it would be fun. And they came with all kind of equipment with the understanding that it will all be turned off. They're going to play, but nobody's going to hear anything. And we would tell the public that this is just at a dog. It's at a level. It's like a dog whistle. Right. The music would be transmitted at a level only dogs can hear. Well, three news crews showed up. I did a speech at the end of it about P.T. Barnum. I actually had a mermaid come out of a big box, and we donated the whole thing. <laughs> There's some footage on YouTube where you can see it. But I Barnumized the whole event. It wasn't just a book. I mean, everybody comes out with a book. There's a 1,000 books every week. Right. How do you make it stand out from the crowd? So I come out with a book, and I Barnumize it with the canine concert. And I've done other things, but that's a quick example. I love that one, Joe. Thanks for sharing that. Now I'm going to have to check it out on YouTube. Um, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always like to ask two questions. One, what's been the lowest moment and then how you push forward through it? And then the flip side, the proudest moment. Wow. So, yeah. Start off, what's been the lowest moment and how you, you push through that time? Well, the lowest moment would be during the struggle years when I'm homeless, desperate, and the world looks black. I don't see anything happening. I'm totally alone. Uh, no car, no place to live, no person I'm with, no friends. And I contemplated suicide wow. at that point. And interesting, the only thing that kept me going was curiosity. Hmm. What if it all changes tomorrow? Really? Next week or next month. So curiosity kind of played into keeping me alive wow. way back before I knew it as a copywriting or psychological technique. Yeah. But... Uh, Curiosity is what kept me going because I really did think that I feel destined to do something you did. with my writing. Yeah. But there's no evidence around me that that's going to happen. Yeah. And so you get so, I got so bleak and so dark that I felt like, well, maybe I should just pull the plug. Wow. But thinking, what if tomorrow changes or next week or next month or next year? And thank God because I would have missed on six decades of some of the most incredible life experiences yeah. that I never knew would be hatching. Yeah. So we, we just never knew, but it was curiosity. And so uh, what was the other one the, about the highlight? Yeah, the proudest moment. The proudest. The proudest. Um, there's a lot of those. Yeah. There's a lot of those. Uh, I'm just going to take the one that comes to mind. Yeah. When my first singer-songwriter album was done, it was called Strut. I had pulled together my resources. I got a rock and roll hall of famer to be my drummer and, and more. Um, 
I was so proud of me because I had to go through, this is a career jump. You know, I'm right. suddenly known as being in the secret and I'm known as an author. I'm known for all these different things. And suddenly I'm going to be a singer songwriter. I applied marketing to it and defined myself as the world's first self-help yeah. singer songwriter. Yes. That's me Barnumizing Direct myself. response, yeah. That's me Barnumizing myself as a musician. Yeah. There's all kind of musicians out there. I'm just yeah. another one. Yeah. Unless I'm the world's first self-help yeah. singer songwriter. Yeah. So coming out with Strut and holding the album, and this isn't it, but just holding the physical copy and realizing I did it. Yeah. I did something I didn't even think was possible. I proved again that there's nothing impossible in life. It's almost as good as the feeling as when you really realize there's nothing impossible in life. Yes. Um, you know, I do notice that with your marketing. It's really interesting. People should just pay attention to how you title things or form things like, you know, the number one hypnotic mark marketer in the world or hypnotic copywriter. You know, you Barnumize everything. Yes. And, you know, I really appreciate your time, Joe. This has been fantastic. Um, where can we point people towards? Where, where should people check out? I know we mentioned the top of uh, the Tracked Money Now and the Secret Pair. Where should people check those out and, and any other resources? Oh, thank you. Well, the free book, Attract Money Now, is at attractmoneynow.com. Yeah. So they can go there. And the Secret Prayer and all my books are on Amazon. My main website is my name, joevitale.com, J-O-E-V-I-T-A-L-E.com, or mrfire.com, M-R-F-I-R-E.com. Yeah. And thank you. Great questions, great inter interchange. And any friend of David Garfinkel's yeah. is now my brother and cousin, too. Awesome. Yeah, if you're ever in Chicago, let me know. And should we reveal your discovery at the, the Barnum gravesite, or should people check out your book? I'll give them the short version of them. I think they should check out the book as it gives a longer, yeah. more spine chilling uh, uh, version. And the audio program, The Power of Outrageous Marketing, I think is pretty hypnotic, compelling, yeah. and spine tingling in itself For to sure. hear that narration. Yeah. Because that was recorded close to the moment it happened. Mm. So I was still feeling that electrical charge. Yeah. But when I went to Barnum's graveside, I put my hands on his stone there. And I felt an electric charge jump through it, and I fell to my knees. And I remember staring at his little, this was his slogan for life, not my will, but thine be done. And I was absorbing the energy, if you will, of P.T. Barnum. And when I got up, I knew what to do with my book. I knew how to write my book. I knew how to Barnumize the book. It was like I suddenly absorbed the spirit and channeled P.T. Barnum. Mm. I became Barnum. Yeah, yeah, love it. On that note, Joe, thank you so much. I will let you get back to you have a very short deadline on your next book. Back on the stick. Yes, and I appreciate your time. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 